I'm standing in front of a class of third graders in a New York City public school, and we're talking about writing stories. The kids have already begun their stories. There's already a little P who just wants to jump out of a can before he gets eaten, and there's Penny and Penny, an actual Penny and a mouse named Penny, who are just dying to change places in life. And there's a, a tall walking building who wants to take over the world. And I tell the kids that their characters are amazing. And I'm wondering what mistakes they can make, what mistakes they're making, the little ones, the big ones, that they can learn from or that we can learn from as readers. They look at me in horror. One brave boy raises his hand and he says, Miss Rebecca, shark warriors do not make mistakes. <laughs> But we break up into our group so we can talk a little bit more about character flaw and just jump into our writing. And a little girl named Jenny walks up to me and she says, Miss Rebecca, I, I think I have a character flaw. My, my character, she drinks too much alcohol. And I said, wow, that's, that's incredible. That's very powerful. Um, it, sounds, it sounds like a good story idea to work with. And she was so excited by that response and she sat down and she started writing. And the other kids and I, we talked a little bit about character flaw, and they all jumped in, excited to start another period of writing. <clears throat> a few minutes later, um, about you know, a little bit later into the, into the session, the classroom teacher came over excitedly to see how everyone was doing. And she looked over at Jenny's story, and she said, <laughs> oh, Jenny, how do you know about that? And Jenny turned red. And I just wanted to say to her, she knows because she's a person. I don't actually know how she knows, but she knows, and she's processing the world with us. And we should cherish that rather than fear that. And we looked at each other, and the teacher kind of nodded, and it seemed like she kind of understood, and she said, good job, Jenny. And then, you know, a few weeks ago, a few weeks earlier, uh, a, a girl, one of the most enthusiastic writers in the class, she was working on a story about a girl who was born without bones. And this girl, the problem was she wanted to become a gymnast. So in order to become a gymnast, she had to have bones. So the only way that she could achieve those bones, though, was by committing murder. Her classroom teacher, I, and I don't know where she was going to take that or how she was going to get there yet, but we didn't get a chance to start to process that before her classroom teacher walked over to her and said, this story cannot be written in my classroom. And she pulled me over and she explained something like she's the daughter of um, one of the PTA members and she just didn't want to deal with complaints and it was too stressful and I understood. And I said, okay, but the thing is, is that that enthusiastic writer has written very little since. You know, when we create these spaces for kids' true authentic stories to sneak out, People get really stressed out. You know, they start to say, think, "Oh my gosh, look at look at my daughter's writing. Look at my daughter's writing. She's so silly. Is she not serious enough? Or, you know, or gosh, is my son too violent? Or does she seem depressed? Or worst of all, what does this say about me, as a parent?" But the thing is, it doesn't really say much. You know, and Halloween, we decorate our schools and our neighborhoods with skeletons. We let our kids read goosebumps and Hunger Games, and Lord of the Flies. And when you think about it, I can't think of a classic novel that doesn't have multiple allusions to violence, mortality, dysfunction. And, you know, but when an eight-year-old gets inspired by some of these ideas, or God forbid, a teen, we all freak out. Water. Sorry. <laughs> In 2007, I created a a nonprofit organization called Rytopia. It's a place where kids come after school, weekends, summer, and summers to work in these small, cozy spaces on couches, groups of six, with published authors or playwrights. And what's amazing is that these kids come from New York City's nicest townhouses, from local city projects, and from everything in between. And they talk about the world together, and they talk about real characters, they talk about fictional characters, and they process and they develop their pieces with each other and in support of one another. And in the end, the pieces that emerge are extraordinary. And they're doing this with adults who are comfortable with their thoughts and with their stories, and who are not scared of them. I like to say that Rytopia is this place where silly, where we, is this place where silly ideas are taken extremely seriously, and serious ideas do not cause alarm. <laughs> um, and you know, we're not the only people who really want to create these 
spaces for real creative writing to emerge and who have this longing for soulful connections with kids. We partner, we, we leave our labs and we partner with public schools and with private schools across the city. And in that same school where Jenny is working on her story, in the classroom right next door, there's this amazing teacher who came in last week into our room and said, can, can you guys, can all the instructors come into my room because I want to act out all my kids' stories because they're so amazing. And you know, she wants to do that because she loves her kids' stories, because she's not scared of her, of her children's stories, because she knows that your stories are the stuff of life, and she knows that your vision and your dreams are the stuff of our future. Word has spread about Raytopia. Reluctant writers are writing or considering themselves writers all of a sudden. And kids who used to say they hated writing are loving writing now. And kids who always loved writing are writing on a higher level and more openly than ever before. And people ask me, Rebecca, how did you do it? And I tell them that I didn't do it. Actually, our kids did it because they demonstrated something extraordinary. They demonstrated that when writing authentic, uncensored work, they transformed into powerful writers. Since we emerged in 2007, our students have won more regional and national writing awards than any other group of kids in the entire country. Um, but here is something that we should all be scared of. In 2008, the English Journal reported that 67% of high school rising freshmen tested below grade level in writing. This is alarming because literate people go to college, literate people succeed more often in college. And Two-thirds of, of, of Americans working in large companies are required to write. Writing is seen as a gatekeeper to the most promising jobs. So what, have our, what has been the response among our education leaders? To create a new standardized writing test. Yeah. <laughs> as one of my students, um, who's now at Princeton, who's been an extraordinary writer since I met her when she was 12 years old, she you know, explained to me when she, was when she was studying for this test that she had to actually unlearn writing in order to learn the formulaic writing that was required of this test. And then, now we're on the verge of creating new standardized writing curricula to meet the demands of this test. You know, we have to, you know, we're going to study for tests that we need to take because we need to go to college. But the thing is, there's a systemic problem here. Sorry. Rytopia has a different response to this. When we leave our labs and we go into schools, the kids, win, win, uh, the kids grin widely when we walk into their classrooms. And a week and a half ago, little, this little girl, Carly, ran up to one of our instructors and said, look, I've written four pages since I saw you. And she sat down and immediately started revising and editing. And the instructor said, wow, Carly, you're an amazing editor. Do you approach all of your writing assignments this way? And she said, no, this is my story. <laughs> <laughs> well, a few minutes later, something kind of challenging happened in that classroom. Four school officials, with all the best intentions, came into that classroom to assess whether this school was meeting the needs of its students. I think this class was just picked randomly. And they started walking over and asking the kids questions. And they asked questions like, do you know, what, do you know whether you're going to get an A or an F on that paper? And the kids, these third graders, were very surprised and didn't know how to answer the question, didn't say anything. And then as they left, the principal, who's a real supporter of our program, said to the classroom teacher, you're going to have to start writing objectives on the board for this writing class, and you're going to have to apply writing rubrics and graphic organizers. Graphic organizers. Um, and, I, and, I, and I was thinking, you know, what would our objective have been on the board that day? I guess it would have been keep writing your amazing stories, keep channeling all that you know and imagine, and consider character flaw today. You know, those flaws, that sometimes, those mistakes that sometimes even adults make before our eyes? It took the classroom teachers and the instructors almost the whole period to get the kids feeling open and writing again. Because when you start talking about grades, creativity often shuts down. And when kids see adults get anxious, they shut down. And, and the thing is, is that you know, there's nothing wrong with an objective on the board. In fact, we see that this helps kids you know, all over the country, it helps, stay, it helps them stay focused and know what's at task. And those four school officers, they were asking about our grading system because they know that kids will not succeed in school if they don't know what's required of them and what's expected of them. But the thing is, is that we are not grading our kids in creative writing because we cannot grade. 
Because creative writing, you cannot grade creative writing and truly inspired writing. So then where does creative writing fit into all of this, is the question. Hopefully, not too many of you will relate to this, but some of you might. Um, when um, a lot of teens and kids will say that they don't feel um, that they they don't feel like they, that their te that their adults in their school communities know who they are, and they don't feel comfortable being who they being their full selves in the classroom. And often this just leads to kids feeling kind of disconnected or annoyed, but sometimes it leads to depression, and in the most extreme cases, it leads to kids dropping out of school. In America's largest cities, 50% of high school students drop out of high school. And 88% of those kids who dropped out said that they were bored. Theo, one of my favorite teens who I've been working with for years, who's 16 years old, goes to one of New York City's top high schools, and he's been writing for years, and we've produced his plays. He said to me the other day, he said, Rebecca, how come when I'm given a creative writing assignment in school, it almost makes me angry? Shouldn't I be so happy that I'm being given this platform to like, be who I really am and do what I love? And then he started talking to me about the assignment and about the grading system. And he said, you know, he said, I guess I feel tricked because it's not really creative writing. And really what Theo's point is, is that there's a tremendous difference between creative writing that you do for yourself or to inspire an audience and the writing that we do to meet other people's expectations. Creating these kind of spaces in school that really lends itself to the highest level writing is proven very difficult to create. But all creative writing teachers know that the first step is embracing kids' authentic stories. We can, create high, we can create systems of high standards without standardization. Kids say they feel bored. Creative writing is an opportunity for the deepest emotional and intellectual engagement. And this is the whole reason why I started Writopia. In 2006, I was, working at, I, I was starting a creative writing program at a small private school in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I was working very closely with this wonderful boy who's 12 years old named Rami. And he was writing a deeply personal memoir about struggling with his feelings of not being masculine enough. And over a month of working privately together, he was discovering an arc and finding resolution and polishing his essay. And he finally felt like he could share it with his group. And the kids in the group were stunned and honored and moved that he was sharing this piece with them. And I, one of the girls was holding his hand in support during the conversation. And in the middle of this, the new principal came into the room and saw what we were talking about. And she said, oh, Rami, just trying to get attention again, and walked out of the room. And we were all a little confused, but we just processed it, and we kept going. But that night, Rami read his, uh, that night, Rami's mother read his memoir for the first time. And she loves her son, and she only wants the best for her son. And it was really painful for her to see that he had been going through pain, and she started to cry. And he was so upset that this piece of writing that he was so proud of brought his mother pain. You know, um, I have children, too, and my oldest is only three, so I don't know what it's all about yet. But when my three-year-old was only six months old, it was time to give her her first rice cereal, her first solid food. And we put her in her high chair, we gave it to her, and she started to cough. I took her out so fast, almost put her upside down, she threw up, I put her back in, and she would not eat solid food for another six months. <laughs> now, I think is, as parents, you know, we have to hold it back. We have to learn to reel it in and not overact to our children. Because things like writing are really important. And so is eating. <laughs> so we got to work on that. Um, so that same year that I was at the school um, with Rami, 40, 40 kids from that school were all working with me on their lunch periods and their free periods um, to develop fiction and memoir, and memoir with me. They were writing for the first time these kinds of pieces, and they were on fire, and they were so excited. And that was the year that I had first learned about the Scholastic Writing Awards, which is an amazing opportunity you guys should all look into. And, um, and we submitted all of their work, and we were surprised and thrilled to learn that those kids from that small, obscure private school that a lot of people hadn't heard of before won more regional awards than any other group of kids from any school that year in the city. And we were all so happy, but that principal wasn't impressed, and she pulled me aside and lamented on, about the resources that the school had been putting into make-believe. And I was really happy that when I turned around and faced the parents, they had a very different reaction. They had watched their kids over the year. They stood back and watched this extraordinary writing process, and they saw the results of it, and they were so moved by the different kinds of pieces that came out of the program. And um, 
I went to a few of them and I asked them, I told them I had this vision of a socioeconomically diverse version of this program that would be accessible to many more kids in the city. And a few of them helped me launch Raytopia that spring. I will never forget the day that we opened. My dear friend Dan Katroser and I were standing around an empty room and he kept looking at me saying, we're open, and we're open, and we kept laughing. But you know, by that summer, our program was filled. And five years later now, we, run, we have over 2,000 kids who come to our writing labs in New York, Westchester, Washington, D.C., L.A. And there's a reason why, our, why it's filling, because there are so many reasons to learn to write. We learn to write because it feels so good to be understood. We learn to write because it's so exciting to have a storyline in your mind and to execute it in your vision. We learn to write because it's cathartic to turn pain to power. We learn to write because we need to. Ken Robinson, one of my favorite education writers and speakers, said in a really wonderful TED Talk, he asserted that creativity and education should be held in the same, in the same regard as literacy. I would add humanity to that list because our children's stories, the essence of their humanity, is the most important thing. It, because, sorry, because celebrating our children's stories, the essence of their humanity, is the most important thing that we can do for them and for our future. Dream big. Your ideas, raw and uncensored, have power. Now write something. <laughs> <laughs>